I want to thank Dave for inviting me here tonight, and I really appreciate it. I, I want to thank uh, the people here at China Buffet for the fantastic food that they have and the service that they're providing. I think we should give them a round of applause. Thank them very much. All right, as we start off this talk tonight, the one question I've got, uh, which actually goes for everybody, is uh, you might ask, who am I? David introduced me a little bit, but I'll take that question your direction. If somebody asks you, who are you, what's your answer? Are you an engineer? Are you retired? Are you a father? Are you, what's your answer you give? For, for myself, my answer is, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I accepted Christ way, way back in 1992, but to be a disciple, you have to do more than just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. See, to be a disciple, you have to try to live like him, walk like him, and become more like him, make an effort. And so that's where I say I've become a disciple of Jesus Christ, which should be a goal of all of us. Who else am I? I happen to be a husband. My lovely wife, Joan, is here. We've been married for 34 years. And by the way, I don't know if anyone is aware, but she is standing next to a tree here. And that tree has one of my, produces what goes into one of my favorite foods. Does anybody recognize this is taken down in Costa Rica? Any thoughts? It's a cacao tree. Yeah, it's very good where the cocoa bean comes from and you get chocolate, right? All right. Also, she's sitting here on one of her favorite animals, which happens to be a turtle or tortoise. I happen to also be a father. This here is my uh, eldest son, Zach. I don't know if anybody recognizes what's behind him. The Ark. How many of you guys have been to the Ark? There we go. Wow, this is fantastic. If you haven't been to the Ark, I just recommend you have to go to the Ark. It's a must-see, a must-see. Next, I also have a son, Aaron, and a daughter, Rosa. Here, uh, Aaron happens to be a graduate from the theater program at Milwaukee here, and he works in the Milwaukee area. Rosa is attending Concordia. She happens to be here in the back corner. You can turn around and wave to her, embarrass her. <laughs> She's halfway through the PhD program, so almost there, coming in. I also have here Rosa with my soon-to-be son-in-law. And so this is Zach, and you will notice that there's two Zachs here. One has an H, one has a K. He happens to be working close by here as well in the uh, police department at Bayside. I happen to be a graduate. I have a degree of zoology from Madison, a degree, a master's of statistics from Madison, and I also have an MDiv from Trinity Evangelical Divinity Seminary. And my favorite animal. I'm glad a few survived the fires back a while ago. I also am an associate director of statistical programming. Big long title, not sure if that means much to many people, but I'll try to explain it to you. I oversee what happens with the data that comes to pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies try to get drugs approved to the FDA and other agencies around the world. And in order to do that, they run studies. The studies get run through programming, and the programming analyzes it, summarizes it, and then it gets sent to the agencies. I work with the people that summarize the data and gets it prepared for submissions around the world. And so, simply put, I help pharmaceutical companies obtain drug approval from FDA and other agencies around the world. A couple of the areas that I've worked in are oncology, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, and infectious diseases. One of my favorite verses, especially for coming into this talk tonight, is Psalm 139. For you, and we're talking to God here, form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. As we go into a talk of a biogenesis and science, to me it's great comfort to know that I am made by God. I am knit together by God. 
are not an accident that happened by atoms coming together. Being a statistician, I hope I'm not going to have you guys fall asleep here, but I'm going to go into a little bit about numbers. And when we go into numbers, what I want to point out is sometimes when numbers get very large or very large, small, large or small, we may lose the real meaning of those numbers. They become incomprehensible. Take the national debt. Does anybody know where we are at today with the national debt? What dollar amount? Thirty-one trillion dollars. Now, when I say incomprehensible, do we comprehend that? If I held out a hundred dollars, you understand a hundred. A thousand dollars, you might understand. A million dollars, eh, some of them might start be losing. Well, what's a million dollars? A billion. But when you get to a trillion, what is that? We lose comprehension. And I bring this up because in many of the arguments in science that are used, large numbers or small numbers are brought in, we don't truly have an understanding of what they mean. If you don't truly understand what they mean, you can accept the argument or you don't have any way to refute the argument that's presented. So, abiogenesis. What is abiogenesis? Very simply put, the idea that life arose from non-life. The idea that you have a rock, you have some goo, and life arose from it. For tonight, what we're going to do is start off with looking at the Big Bang. I'm just going to give a very small synopsis, just looking at a little piece of the Big Bang, and then we're going to dive all the way into human cells. And from the human cells, we're going to start at the cell membrane, move on to amino acids, proteins, and DNA. And I'm not going to get into a lot of details if you're worried about that. If you wanted the details, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay? I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible, but try to prove some very, very important points here tonight. So first off, a little bang. Let's see if the little bang works. And this is a demonstration, demonstration to kind of set you up for the Big Bang. All right, so this simple demonstration, I want to point out a few items in this demonstration. First off, what's all involved? I needed a bag and air. I needed some matter. I needed some matter together here. I needed the bag to be inflated, right? If it's not inflated, it's not going to make a bang. The air in the bag also needed to be sealed. It needed to be sealed. And finally, I needed to have some pressure brought up against it to cause the big bang. Energy of force needed to be brought against it. I bring these, the, I bring these items up as we dip, delve into the Big Bang and look at some of the properties that are associated with the Big Bang. If you've been to some museums or you go to Wikipedia, you will see this chart presented, which gives a model for the Big Bang. What you see on the far left side is the, what we call the singularity. And then as time you move on to the right, we call that an expansion of time and space, time and space with that. They don't necessarily like to refer to it as a bang as much as an expansion of time and space. There are many items associated with this. What I like to do is look at the Big Bang itself, and I don't know if many people have looked at the details, but I decided to look at some of the details that happen at the singularity and see if they make sense. So first off, how hot was the beginning? It's listed at being at 10 to the 32nd degrees Celsius. How hot is this? They claim that it's so hot that matter and time come and go. Let you think about that a little bit. Time and matter come into existence and leave existence. Again, and, and I should qualify, not all the scientists around believe in the same theory itself, 
but for the people that are published on Wikipedia, this is listed there. So how hot is this? We know water boils at 100 degrees. How hot is the sun? Let's try to bring that in. The surface is about 5,500 degrees, and the core is at 15 million degrees. So let's do a comparison here. You've got boiling water at 100 degrees, you've got the sun's core at 15 million, and how hot is the Big Bang? That's how many zeros are represented for how hot the Big Bang is. Questions I have for this is how do you measure this temperature and even know it existed? So how do you prove it? Another question is where did the energy come from to create this temperature? As far as I know, the hotter you make things, the more energy you need to put into the system. So how did they get this so hot? I do want to point out that I'm not against theoretical models. As a statistician, I'm used to dealing with big numbers, small numbers. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. I'm trying to say that if you're using this as your evidence for a theory that you're trying to say is fact, is there some evidence you can back it up with? All right, and that's continuing on with a few of the other points as well. There's something called a Planck length, which is how small, what is the distance of the singularity when it's all compressed. It is given as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35th meters. How small is this? Well, if we look at blood cells, which you need to look at through a microscope, they run between 2 to 3 times 10 to the negative 6th. If you look at atoms, helium, helium happens to be at 1 to 5 times 10 to the minus 10th. All right, so we're going from blood cells, we're going down to uh, atoms. So how small is a plank? How small was everything before the expansion happened, the bang? There's your blood, there's your atoms, you ready? That's how small they say the plank length is. Everything was compressed that small. Again, questions I have is how do you measure this? How do you prove this? How did the whole universe get shrunk so small? To me, again, there seems to need to have energy put into the system to crunch it this small. The initial speed of the bang itself, 0 to 10 to the minus 43rd seconds is considered a Planck epoch. Or in other words, that's the time for the initial expansion, just the initial expansion. This is about, anybody want to try to start and stop their watch that fast? How, again, how do you measure this? How do you prove it? It, it? There's no way that you can actually literally prove these statements in this theory. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying you cannot prove it. So challenges of the Big Bang. Just challenges in general for the Big Bang. Where did matter come from? We need to have a start with matter. What existed before the Big Bang? Was matter always here? Where did it come from? What caused the Big Bang? Again, if there, we had a stasis of the singularity, why did it suddenly expand? Why did it, you know, what caused it? What caused it to change state? Did time always exist? Again, they have time coming and going. I could question, you know, we talk about God being eternal. This is one that kind of throws my mind a little bit. Uh, God's eternal, and how far back does that go? I, that's a little hard even for myself to comprehend. What is a singularity? Within the scientific community, this is highly even debated if the term is correct. And so with that term, what exactly is it? Why is there an acceleration of the expansion of the universe? For some of you who may not be aware, the universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating 
on the expansion. That's been measured. What is causing an acceleration? It, you push something and it should start to slow down, all right? That's not happening right now. Likewise, why does our spiral galaxy even exist? Over time, a spiral galaxy will spin itself out and the stars go further and further out. If you're looking at billions and billions of years, guess what? The stars should not be there. This is known across the whole community. This isn't just us pointing to it. Finally, where did dark matter come from and what are its properties? Dark matter, you'll see that if you get into cosmology, there's things called dark matter, dark energy, all right? What are its properties? Well, I was in Dallas at the museum, Perot Museum, and snapped a picture of this. Dark mysterious matter, something called dark matter accounts for about a quarter of the universe's total mass. It's mixed in and visible matter, but we can't see it because it doesn't interact with light. So how do we know it exists? Scientists noted, kid you not, that rotating galaxies lack matter to stay together. As such, dark matter describes the source of the gravity that keeps galaxies from flying apart. Many questions about dark matter still remain unanswered today. If you have a paradigm that says that the galaxy must be three, four billions of years old, five billions of years old, you need an answer to why the spiral galaxy is sitting there together. From a young Earth perspective, we have no problems. From an older Earth, you've got a problem here. And so their answer is something called dark matter. All right, so that's my talk on the Big Bang. We are now gonna jump all the way across from the Big Bang, past the Earth. There's a lot of stuff it could say about solar systems, how the Earth came about, how the Moon came about, many arguments to establish that these are not done on a young Earth, or done on a billions of years model. Where we are going to is the human cell. And so when you look at a human cell, one thing I do want to point out, many times you see a nice little cute model. This is great to show you the inside of a cell and some of its main organelles that are there. The thing about a nice simple drawing like this is that you could say by abiogenesis, this could happen naturally. It looks pretty simple. A few dots here, a few strings here, that could all come together naturally. In reality, let's look at some details. Here is an image of an inside of a cell. This looks more like a structure that has super highways running back and forth and other structures that take a lot more design in with it. So starting off with the cell, what we're gonna do is look at the cell membrane. All right, just the exterior of the cell. After all, that should be pretty simple, and that should be something that we could establish can come about naturally or not. Well, what is a cell membrane? It's a barrier, right? It's a barrier that keeps out unwanted materials and keeps in the wanted materials that we want. It also provides a transport mechanism to move things in and out of the cell itself, all right? So, with that being said, as a little illustration, here I have a water balloon, all right? This water balloon serves as a membrane, if you think about it. It is keeping water inside. It's keeping the air out. So in some ways, this functions as a membrane, but it's missing one major piece. It's not providing a method to get things in and outside of the cell inside of the bloom. So, the bloom, good barrier, but missing the transport system. So, what do you call a cell without a membrane? A puddle, all right, all right. And if you like that, you can thank Dave. If you didn't, you can blame me. <laughs> 
All right, so let's take a closer look at the cell membrane. The cell membrane in humans, we have a lipid bilayer. All right, this is a very simple drawing of the cell membrane. And with this, you see you got what we call fat, little fatty legs. They're hydrophobic, they don't like water. And then you got the heads. And the heads are hydrophilic, they do like water. And so it's not completely just a plain piece of material, it is a molecular structure. Little legs, we've got two of them. And not only that, but it's a bilayer. So you've got both directions. You've got bi a lipid below and a lipid above, so to speak, forming a bilayer. What's cool about this property, it keeps out water while still allowing oxygen, carbon dioxide, and steroids to pass through. So a question we want to ask is, can this be created naturally? Can we actually come about this naturally? Well, you may be surprised, but if you have a phospholipid solution, you can get these structures to form. You can get something called a liposome, which is a sphere of a lipid bilayer. You can get a micelle, which is not a bilayer, it's just got a single layer. And then you can get a sheath, all right? And so you got a bilayer sheath. And so these can form if you have phospholipids floating in a solution and you let it settle. Question you may want to ask is, can this solution happen naturally? I don't know. It's just a question I would pose and do more follow-up. A bigger question, a bigger question is, how would you go from this lipid bilayer to a living cell? We're just on a surface here. We're just on a surface. We need a living cell. How do you get from this? If you look at the liposome there, we need inner materials. I like to say which came first. You've got a cell membrane out there, and did that exist first, and then somehow we got DNA and proteins inside of it? And then you got that whole inner workings all started working? Or did you have a sheath, a sheath sitting there, and let's say you had some DNA and proteins somehow gathered together, and the, I guess the sheath comes over and envelopes it like an amoeba, and then you get a cell working? Are you guys following? This is either direction you go, even if you have phospholipids, you're a far way off from a living cell. This is still a far way off from a living cell. In addition, the phospholipid bilayer is a very simple model. What does the cell membrane truly look like? If we look in details, this is what you've got. The cell membrane is embedded in with many different particles, molecules, many proteins. Okay, okay, hold on. If I say protein, are you thinking of the Mongolian beef, the shrimp? <laughs> Those are all good. They were good here. Uh, but we're talking molecular proteins, not that kind of protein. We're talking molecules, proteins that are made by amino acids, all right? And so these molecules that are made are embedded in the cell membrane. They provide structure, they provide transportation of getting things in and out of the cell, and they also provide communication. Question you might want to ponder is just how much, how many proteins are there in a cell membrane? What percent, if you think, what percent, what percent do you think could just be made up of proteins just in the cell membrane? 5%, 10? That's a lot. They believe 50% of the cell membrane is made up of proteins. You are now looking and thinking about millions of proteins are embedded around a single cell. This is, this is crazy. I mean, this is a lot of proteins. How did the cell membrane become so complex by natural means? How can you get this? This gets repeated. How do you get a process to put this in place? To me, this is where things become just simply impossible. Simply put, it is impossible. Another way to think about this is, how do you go from a mass of phospholipids, living cells, with all that complex inner parts like amino acids, proteins, and DNA? What if you thought about taking a car? 
take all the parts of your car apart, every single part, lay it across on your yard, maybe on your driveway, if you can imagine doing that, you know, thousands and thousands of parts. You go to bed at night, and the next morning, guess what? Your car's up and running. <laughs> to me, this is the same kind of direction. If you really expect for a cell membrane to have this many proteins in it operating at a time and accomplishing what it needs to do, it's along that same line of plain and simply impossible. So next we're going to jump into amino acids. What do we know about amino acids? They're organic compound, they're carbon based, they are building blocks of proteins. I'll be talking about proteins in a little bit, but proteins are built from amino acids. Hundreds exist in nature, 20 are critical to human life. So they've identified 20 amino acids that we need in human life. All right, many of you are probably aware of the Miller-Urey experiment. Now, didn't that just prove that amino acids can naturally be created, right? Well, for those of you who may not know the Miller-Urey experiment done in 1952, what we see here, again, is the model that was used back then. You've got hydrogen, methane, and ammonia. They were put through some glass tubing. You put an electric spark on it. You have condensation. And then you get the products condensed out. Predominantly, tar was brought out. However, they did get some amino acids. In this experiment itself, there are five amino acids discovered. Three are only critical to life. So it's not five critical to life. So after 70 years, where do we stand today? We've got a lot of technology, and literally there's been thousands of experiments done. Thousands of experiments trying to show how we can get all 20 amino acids produced. Where are we today? They have roughly produced 15 out of the 20 critical life amino acids. Now I will point out that some of this is also because we have better technology. They can measure very, very small quantities of amino acids. Another thing to point out is, even though you can get 15 out of 20, these aren't from the same experiment. Here's a summary of some of the experiments that are done. On the left side, you'll see are the amino acids. And then you've got the Miller-Urey experiment, along with the three amino acids that it produced. And since then, they try to change environmental conditions. One of them they're exploring is volcanic discharge. If you had an environment similar to that, how many amino acids can you produce? The latest one here in 2021 was exploring the glass tubing itself. How important is the glass tubing? What's interesting is that they found that if you use Teflon or some other substance, that didn't produce as many amino acids that you needed to have this glass tubing condensation area to produce the amino acids. So in other words, you've got a restriction on your environment that you need for amino acid production. Again, where are we at? So a single environmental condition can still only produce about half of the amino acids. That's after 70 years of research and many thousands and thousands of experiments going on. So in summary, we still need a highly controlled environment to produce the amino acids. Somehow glass uh, helps with the production, and none of the old problems have been solved. What am I saying by none of the old problems? I'm gonna go through a summary of a couple of them. I'm not going through an exhaustive list, but some of the old problems. First off, chirality. Many of you may be aware of chirality. This is the idea that a, um, molecules can be of a left-handed or right-handed structure form. Left-handed or right-handed. And why is this important? Glad you asked. All right, so Miller-Urey had a 50-50 uh, uh, mix of left-handed and right-handed molecules come out. So that makes sense, 50-50 of each. Well, what's the problem? Well, amino acids for life are, interestingly, left-handed. I almost sometimes ponder, did God purposely do this to leave some signals for us? because the, what's beyond this is that the left-handed ones are needed for life, but right-handed will cause problems with amino acids, with their functioning, 
and it will prevent abiogenesis from occurring. Interestingly, most enzymes only work with left-handed amino acids. Interesting. What else? Well, the Miller-Urey experiment did not have oxygen in it. All right. So if it didn't have oxygen in it, why not? They realized oxygen destroys amino acid production. That's why they didn't have it there. Now you have a problem. You need to have a, figure out a solution of how did oxygen get into our environment. Now, of course, if you've read papers, they had a solution for that too. Uh, I can't say how much acceptable or believable their method is. However, I can tell you today in their community, I will say their community is in non-creation community, uh, scientists believe that oxygen was present in the early atmosphere. So if that is true, then the Miller-Urey experiment really can't function. All right, they have to come up with a different model for abiogenesis. Likewise, in the Miller-Urey experiment, they're assuming the atmosphere is made up of methane and ammonia. Current research actually says, guess what? If this is in their community, this isn't just our community, that they do not believe methane and ammonia were part of the early atmosphere. All right, again, a problem. Another problem is dilution. In order for this to work, you usually look at trying to concentrate the amino acids. Instead, you've got a watery mix. We know what happens with water, it dilutes. So, as such, Ure proposed that you needed at least a 10% solution of organic compounds. Scientists have looked into this and realized this is plain and simply impossible. Plain and simply impossible to have that high of a concentration of organic compounds floating around. Another issue with this, the Miller-Urey experiment is uh, temperature itself. Miller and Urey produced it at room temperature. Why is that an issue? Well, interestingly, you need a higher temperature to maintain proteins. That's what amino acids go on to produce. So they're running at a temperature that's great to create the amino acids. However, you cannot get to proteins at that temperature. Destructive cross-reactions, all right? The, the issue here is there are many, many compounds out there that will get, interfere with amino acids and their production. This includes such, such things as ethanol, isopropyl, alcohol, sugars, heavy metals, cyanide, carbon monoxide, and other contaminants. You kind of get the drift. There are many, many items, many uh, chemicals out there that can interfere with the production of amino acids. Also, we've got wavelength. Miller and Urey used a specific wavelength, all right, to produce their amino acids. Why did they use just a narrow range wavelength? Well, regular sunlight will destroy amino acids in their production. You have a problem here. Now you've got a narrow bandwidth to create the amino acids, but you need to be out of sunlight, all right? So, so that, that's kind of a contradiction going on there. So in summary, in summary, only a small amount of amino acids can be created in a very controlled environment of the Miller-Urey type of experiment. How can we naturally create all 20 of the amino acids that are critical to life, which are so unstable, requiring for every specific environmental condition. How can that be done? Again, I'll just put one word out there. It's impossible to see this happening for amino acids. Next, jumping into proteins. So proteins, as I was illustrating before, here is a picture of a protein, all right? This is myoglobin, the first protein to have its structure sought by X-ray crystallography. All right, fantastic. So it is called, it's formed, you see nice little ribbons, a 3D shape. Keep that in mind as we think about its production naturally. What are proteins? 
Well, there are a series of up to 20 different amino acids. The shortest protein has roughly 400 amino acids in it. Anybody here familiar with bananagrams? Oh, you can raise your hand back there. No. <laughs> Okay, so if you're not familiar with bananagrams, are you familiar with Scrabble? And, and so Scrabble, you got your little crossword puzzle that you're forming, right? And well, in, in Scrabble, you, you know, you're trying to find that, get to that triple letter word and somebody else comes in and takes it away from you. Well, anyway, bananagrams, you get to produce your own, own crossword puzzle and don't have to worry about interference from other people. So just to uh, uh, give you some of the background with Bananagrams, Bananagrams in the game, it's got the 26 letters like you use with Scrabble. What I've done here is actually I've got the letters from actually three games worth of Bananagrams. And what I've done is I've removed off six letters. So basically in this bag I've got 20 letters, all right? So I've got one letter representing each of the amino acids quite a few of them, but I've got one. So I'm matching up letter per amino acid. And the reason I'm doing this is trying to illustrate to you how hard it is to naturally assemble a protein. Because you're trying to assemble amino acids in its order. So first off, what I'm gonna need is for somebody, where we will try to randomly build a protein here. To illustrate, I decided to create the Charles Darwin protein. You guys are going to help me out here. This protein is this sentence here. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory could absolutely what? Break down. This is in the origin of species. This has 159 characters, and so to build this protein, you need to randomly get all these characters in this specific order. All right, and this is one third the size of the smallest amino acid that we've got, or protein, smallest protein that we've got. So, I decided to thin it down a little bit. Let's just make it 14 characters. I don't want to be here all night. And so would somebody like to start off and see if they can pull out an H? And so for this illustration, anybody want to try out? If you can pass that back. All right, so closing your eyes, keep pulling out. I want to know how many tries it takes for you to get an H out. <laughs> Without looking, <laughs> yes. And so, so you can keep and put them, and take the bag out of the container and she can keep and so, so keep pulling out, and you can keep pulling and pulling, and let us know when you get to an H. So as she continues to go here, and if she got an H in the first couple, I was going to take her down to the casino, by the way, and we could be... Uh, How many am I pulling? 14? No, you need an H. Oh, need this protein needs to start with an H. So if we don't have a starting H, we don't have the protein. So she needs to get an H here. All right, and so, so what, what is the probability, as she continue, I'll, I'll just throw some things out here. What is the probability of randomly drawing the, these letters in order, knowing that we've got 20 characters, and this is like building an amino acid. I'm trying to illustrate how can you randomly build an amino acid. The probability for each letter is one in 20. So if you're beyond 20, then you're not doing too good, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, but hey, hey that, that's okay, that's okay. So it's basically one in 20 for each letter. Now we need to get these in the right order. So once you have an H, that's one in 20. Now you need to get an A. That's a one in 20 probability. Then you need to get the V. That's one in 20 probability. All right, so how, what is the overall? You got there yet? No? Uh, I had 20 and I didn't pick an H. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but you, you, can, you can stop. You can stop. That's all right. <laughs> I was hoping maybe, you know, just by chance here. You have 4-8. So, 4-8, there you go. All right. So, 
to get just this little 14, we'll call it amino acid protein, you, this is the odds. It would be one in 20 raised to the 14th power. That's just 14 characters. If we were trying to produce the whole Charles Darwin protein, 159 characters, that's what we would come up with. One in 20 raised to 159th power. This is a number super, super small. You're starting to get, you know, again, I want to make sure you're tracking here. This is getting to be very, very small. This, and this is just for a 159 characters. Think about it. The smallest amino acid is four, or smallest protein is 400 amino acids. So you need to randomly get 400 amino acids in the right order. Are you trying to track? I hope you're trying. This is like incredible, incredible. It becomes a very, very small number. 120 raised to the 400th power. I'm taking some liberties, some generalities for the statisticians out there trying to say, hey, wait, 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 what about? No, no, I'm just trying to keep it simple. Just trying to keep it simple. So how do you randomly get 400 amino acids lined up in the right order? That was the smallest. The largest is 27,000 amino acids. Trying to comprehend, this is, this is impossible, folks. This is impossible. We haven't even got to the point of 3D shape tied in with it. I happen to have here 400 lights. And this 400 lights, you could say, is if each one of these lights represent an amino acid, this would be as small as amino acid or protein, smallest protein. Now the proteins are built in a three-dimensional shape. Let's see if I can do this one second here. All right, try to talk and play around with my model. It, need, it needs to be in the right three-dimensional shape. Now I can crunch this and play around, but I need it in a specific shape. And then when I need to reproduce it, it needs to be in that exact shape. How does that happen? I am seeing intelligence here. I'm seeing an intelligent designer that came up with a process here. So how does this all happen by chance? You guys can guess what the answer is? Impossible. Thank you, impossible. <laughs> All right, so how many proteins, how many different proteins are there in us? I've just talked about proteins in general. How many proteins are there in us? 20,000 different proteins. So I was talking about how do you assemble a protein with its amino acids. Now we're talking about 20,000 different proteins. Okay, this should be kind of like, uh, wow, right? How many proteins are there in a single cell? I could take guesses here. How many do you think? How many proteins are there floating around in your cells? Any thoughts? Million, two million, 100 million. Just your cell membrane has hundreds of millions of proteins in it. Just your cell membrane, all right? What we're talking here is one to three billion proteins in a single cell. This is a lot. Think about it, and, and, and you're talking about this happening naturally. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So how can billions of proteins be made randomly? Let's, 
thank you. Yes, impossible. So if proteins cannot be assembled randomly, how do they get constructed? My answer would be by intelligence, by intelligence or by DNA. So DNA, what we have here is DNA, and I want you to take note of the two ten cents of the negative ninth. That's how thick it is across the two down the helix. This is atomically small. This is very, very small. You're talking 20, 30 atoms across. So a lot of times we see this model, sometimes we look at the cute little picture, but we may not truly understand how small and complex this is. So what is DNA? I'm going to give you the Boyd Roloff definition. The most sophisticated self-repairing computer program in existence which gives multi-dimensional instructions for life. I'll let you absorb that a little bit if you wish. If you don't understand that, I'm going to try to unpack it. Why do I call it a computer program? A computer program gives instructions to do things. So a little basics, DNA, and this is as far as I'm going to delve into for the biology part. It's made up of the four different types of nucleotides. You've got adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those are your four nucleotides. A single line of DNA gives instructions to produce proteins. On to dem demonstration, my last demonstration. For those who can't read, what this says here is uh, uh, RNA polymerase. All right, this little molecular structure, I like to think of it as a molecular machine, goes up and down the DNA and it reads the DNA. And actually the helix is wrapped up and it has to unravel it, read it, and wrap it back up. But I don't want to go into the whole processes. As it's going along and reading, try to do this with the mic in here, as it's going along and reading, it produces something called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is a copy of the DNA strand. So it's going along copying it. This little messenger RNA goes on to a ribosome. Well, actually, it gets processed. There's a couple steps involved. Eventually, it gets to a ribosome. The ribosome gives instructions to create proteins. It pulls in the amino acids, which assembles the proteins. I don't want to spend time in the translation, transcription stuff. What I'm trying to explain to everyone here is that you have instructions. The instructions are going from here to here onto the proteins. They need to be in the right order. Otherwise, the protein does not get made. So what you have here, running back and forth, nucleotides must be in the right order for the proteins to get made. All right, so what happens is, we call it unidirectional at least, as it's going along in one direction, reading each and every piece along there. The following information I have pulled from Dr. Carter, who has something called four-dimensional DNA. And so a lot of this materials, I'll just give credit, credit his direction. So one strand of DNA can have 200 million nucleotides lined up in order. All right, big number. We are talking about proteins. Proteins needing 400 amino acids in a row, up to 27,000. We said that was impossible. That was, we are now looking at trying to get 200 million nucleotides in the right order. Big number, big, big number. This is amazing. This is like a computer program. I was talking about computer program because a computer program provides instructions. Any computer programmers here? I know there's at least one. <laughs> there we go. If you're not a computer programmer, my apologies. My apologies, all right? This may not mean much to you, but here you go. This is, happens to be a piece of SAS code. This SAS code is uh, a formula that will produce, or a piece of code that produces uh, the body mass index if you're given the height and weight. 
So simple code, you guys don't have to memorize the code or anything, I won't give a test later on. But what's important is if I have one character misplaced, if I have one typo, if I'm missing a semicolon, guess what happens? Error, the code doesn't work. This is the same thing that happens with your DNA. DNA needs to have all the letters lined up in a specific order to produce and regulate protein production. How much DNA is in your body? Anybody have any thoughts? Here we go. All right, if you took every strand in one cell, every strand of DNA, line them up end to end, how long would that be? It actually stretches to six feet. This is one cell. One cell in your body, if you stretch it end to end, six feet of DNA, just one cell. If, how many cells in are in a human adult? Some of you may know this. Anybody know how many cells we've got roughly? A few trillion? More than a few trillion. <laughs> yep. 60 to 100 trillion. There's roughly, guessing, guessing roughly 100 trillion cells in your body. Now, not all of them have uh, DNA in them. So, so we'll say roughly 50 to 60 trillion cells that have DNA for a typical adult. How much DNA is that? How, the, if we look at all the DNA in our body, we attached all that DNA, N for N, how long would this be? How about to the moon and back? Not just once, 140,000 times. Is, is anybody ready to drop their mouth and say, wow? That's what's in your body. That's what all needs to be operating without, well, it does have mistakes that get corrected, but it needs to be in order. That DNA running, those nucleotides need to be in order. DNA, we call this, is in the first dimension, which is reading it forwards along the DNA strand. Can this amount of DNA be created by a natural process? No, <laughs> okay, impossible, right? We are just looking at the first dimension, okay? Are you guys ready to see some stuff amazing, if you're not amazed yet? DNA, they have discovered can now read things forwards and backwards. Okay, I'm not seeing mouth drop yet. <laughs> what does that truly mean? All right, this is like running a computer program one way and then you run it backwards and it produces something else. Like let's say you get a pie graph one way, you run it backwards and you get bar graphs. Okay, not reaching you guys yet. All right, all right, I get it. I'm a computer programmer. Let's think about what if you had a play? We'll pick on Romeo and Juliet. You read it one way, it's Romeo and Juliet. You read it backwards, in letter for letter backwards, you get Hamlet. <laughs> Starting to comprehend here, when you read it backwards, it produces a different protein. It means it's got instructions to create something else. This is crazy, this is crazy. This is beyond anything that we can do today. In addition, we can jump into, it goes along and skips pieces of DNA as it reads. What I'm saying is if that RNA polymerase is going along, it just picks up one nucleotide, goes down a thousand, grabs another one, goes down another thousand, grabs another one, that instruction produces a protein. This is, this is like building a code, so to speak, that's getting unraveled, which when I work on code, that's intelligence. This is, this is, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy when you think about it. That's our DNA in action. Not only that, but they, there are pieces of the DNA that tell other pieces to stop working or start working. How does it do that? You know, this is just, and this is, okay, that's the second dimension. Let's jump to third dimension. Are you ready for this? So, imagine this is your DNA, all right? 
and the DNA gets bundled up. Now, the outer regions will produce instructions. Those, those pieces come from all the way different pieces of your DNA. But it comes together, certain areas will give instructions to produce proteins. Are you understanding how not only do, I can easily make a 3D shape, but can I get it in the right order? I need to have it in the precise order. And I need to somehow know when I put it together that the different pieces of nucleotides are in that right spot. Do you see intelligence here? Yeah. So that's, that's the three-dimensional. DNA strategically folded. The outer exposed regions give instructions to do things. How can this happen by chance? Okay, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. There's a fourth dimension. Believe it or not, DNA changes over time. We know that partially as we're growing and get older, there's pieces of DNA that change. Dr. Carter gives a couple examples. One of them, he talks about liver. Your liver cells, they will see a, recognize a toxin, how it recognizes it, I'm not sure either, but it will change shapes with a toxin, this is in your liver, and rearrange to produce proteins, enzymes that will detoxify that poison. And then once you're detoxified, it goes and moves back to its original shape. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you think this can come about by natural chance. Really think about this. <laughs> you know, this is absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. So, what we've got here in the fourth dimension the toxin, dynamic programming, those in the computer realm, this is truly dynamic programming, changing over time based on conditions that come into it. How does DNA naturally come into existence with information needed for life? Thank you, impossible. <laughs> All right, now it is very, very cool because like Harvard and many of the universities now have these animations. You can go on YouTube and watch many of them. And these animations are put together by freeze fractures and stuff. But it's very, very cool to see what's happening inside the cell. See this in 3D. Isn't this truly amazing? What I see is machinery at work. Machinery requiring intelligence. I don't see randomness happening inside ourselves or even how you can get to this kind of machinery and operation randomly. Within the scientific realm, as you read many journals and see presentations, many times terms are brought up in those articles and presentations. Items like self-purify self-replicating molecules. These terms do not necessarily have evidence backing them, but they make the ease of the argument being presented go much easier, much smoother. To say that something is self-replicating molecules, you can say that that's how you get DNA put together, because you got self-replicating molecules, or you got proteins that self-replicate but there's no basis, no evidence of how this truly happens. This is where I really enjoy, if any of you know Jerry Bergman, he's got a couple books, along with many of the other creationists, that go into a lot of detail looking at some of these terms and saying, hey, be careful of them. They have no truth basis for them. They're really glossing over. Other terms like autocatalytic, spontaneously arise, prebiotically plausible, self-assembling, Synthesize, I love synthesize. You'll see synthesize all over. This synthesized. How? 
No, it, it synthesized. You don't understand. It just naturally synthesized. Nature assembles. I love this. This is like nature assembles. <laughs> the force of nature. You guys, all right. In summary, so as a wrap up here, in summary, big take home messages, what really caused the Big Bang? Something had to start it, what started it? Where did everything come from? You have uh, things there, but where did it truly come from? Cell membranes are way too complex to form on their own. Amino acids, amino acids are too sensitive to be created naturally. Proteins are way too complicated to be assembled by themselves. And DNA operation, well, we'll just say impossible via abiogenesis as what we've seen here today. When we grasp the intricate details about the Big Bang, cell membrane, amino acids, proteins, and incomparable DNA, molecule, we are generally lacking any clear evidence, any clear evidence that life could have been created on its own. Although this does not prove the existence of God, this does not prove the existence of God, we are left with this one certainty. There does not appear to be an alternative explanation. What other explanation do we have? Okay, there is the alien. You guys heard about that, but we... <laughs> okay, so it just, just postpones the starting point is really what aliens do, if you really, really think about it. Let's face it. When we observe such an abundant evidence of intelligent design, which is what we're seeing here, intelligent design, and all these critical aspects to life, doesn't this mean there must have been an intelligent designer. And that's what I leave, with, leave you with tonight. Doesn't that mean that we have an intelligent designer? And all I can do is praise God for that intelligent designer because it is an amazing, an amazing creation that he has given to us.